Okay, so we're back. Um, so we're back to homologous structures, right, which are structures in a body that are built the exact same way but are used for different processes or different ways. So if you look, here's the arm of a human, the leg of a cat, the fin of a whale, and then the wing of a bat. And pretty much it's, it's giving you the science names for all of these bones. And so the one up here in your uh, bicep, that is called your humerus. And so they've shaded it uh, purple. And so if you can see, the humerus is in the same location in all of these uh, animals. But we obviously use it for different purposes. I mean, humans, we have a lot of dexterity and movement in our arm. Whereas whales, not so much. Um, as far as their humerus, it's much shorter and uh, thicker, which of course you would expect for a whale. But it doesn't have it doesn't matter about the size as long as the bones are in the same order. That's homologous. Uh, the phalanges or the fingers are they're always going to be at the bottom, right? Your phalanges. Um, and so for humans, we have a lot of movement in our phalanges, and cats. Um, they're able to bend their phalanges, their fingers or toes, and they have um, the ability to withstand a lot of impact with those. Uh, they're much better about landing on them than humans landing on our fingers. Ours, ours tend to break. And then whales, if you look at whales' phalanges, um, they have four, right, whereas cats and humans and bats have five. Um, whales have really long phalanges. In fact, most of their fin is covered in what we call fingers. And so even though there's no skin in between those fingers, it's still one bone so that they can move it. Um, same thing for bats. Bats, even though they don't use it as fingers, they use it as wings. Um, they still have those phalanges in the same place. It's, it's pretty cool. Okay, here's another evidence of evolution. It's called comparative anatomy. And this is where we take a piece of the body and compare it to different types of animals or different organisms depending on the species. Um, if you look at the left, these are all hands of primates. And so we have a tarsier, which are those little tiny monkeys that you might see at the Gentry Zoo. They call them like suction cup monkeys because their little fingers feel like suction cups right on the end. They're tiny, tiny. And then we have a gibbon, which is another primate, and then a chimp and then a human. And humans are actually categorized as primates when we go through um, the unit on taxonomy and classification. And so we'll get there, but we're all primates in this picture, and so it's comparing the hands of some primates. And if you look, human hands look very similar to the hands of other primates. We all have thumbs. Um, the reason that they cannot do some of the things that we can is because we can actually reach all of our digits with our thumb um, and chimps cannot. They can still grip um, and they can make tools and use those but they do not have the dexterity in their thumb that we do. Okay, if you compare woolly mammoths and elephants, a lot of people think that elephants came from mammoths. That is not true. Um, they had a common ancestor and so you can tell that because they're both pachyderms, right? Uh, they both have the same general shape, general massive size, they have large ears, they both have tusks and a long trunk, um, they have little short tails. For the most part, uh, elephants are not huge on hair, but there are hairy elephants, and mammoths, of course, have a ton of hair because they were made for colder environments. Now, all that says is because they're structured like that, they have a common ancestor, but elephants did not evolve from mammoths just like Humans did not evolve from a chimp. Uh, we simply had a common ancestor, and chimps went this way, and humans went this way. Cell structures, uh, eukaryotic organisms, things with a nucleus, all tend to be similar, and prokaryotic things without a nucleus all tend to be similar. So we look to see if you're a prokaryotic or eukaryotic organism. Comparative embryology. Okay, so this is where we look at the different... Oh, man. Oh. This is where we look at the different embryos of organisms, and if you see a lot of similarities, um, that means that you have a common ancestor. And that common ancestor may be a long, 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 long time ago, but that doesn't mean you don't have one. So if you look at the picture to the right, 
uh, we have lizards, a tortoise, a pig, and a human. And it gives you three stages of the embryological development. And as you can see, at the first stage, we all look pretty much identical. And as we develop, we still look the same. If you'll notice, we have gills right here, little gill slits. They're not really functional as gills, but we all have gill slits. And those actually turn into the bones inside your ear. So your inner ear bones are made from those gill slits. And so what we see on humans is that as an embryo, we have a tail and we have gill slits, which means that at some point we have a common ancestor that had a tail. We had a common ancestor that had gills. Um, just because they go away when we are fully formed doesn't matter. It just means we still have that common ancestor. So you can see later in development we all look different, right? Although, frankly, the human and the pig, it's kind of creepy. They look a lot alike. Um, but you can see that throughout embryological development we all share a lot, which means that we all have a common ancestor. Uh, behavioral comparisons, we will compare species behaviors for certain scenarios. And typically if you behave the same, you probably have a common ancestor, but that's not a surefire way to determine that. Um, in this case, we studied primates, and primates breastfeed their babies. Um, they rock their babies to sleep to calm them down. You know, they try to take care of them. Uh, they can also build tools and use tools to crack open things. They're very good at solving problems. Um, they can make tools to clear pathways. Uh, primates are incredibly intelligent, so studying that behavior helps us um, confirm that we have a link to them. Okay, don't freak out. This is a lot of words. Just don't worry. So biochemical comparisons is where we finally get DNA and bring it in. The Human Genome Project happened in the 90s, and it's where we finally decoded the human genome. Uh, before this point, we knew we had DNA, but we weren't really sure um, how it worked, how many genes we had, you know, blah, 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 blah. And now that we can, we've can, we decoded the human genome, so many things have unlocked. And so now we can also decode the genome of chimps and chickens and plants and whatever else we want. It was a huge discovery um, and one that changed life forever. So when you compare DNA... The more similar your DNA between you and the other species, the closer your common ancestor was, and the more differences you have, the farther away your common ancestor was. So for example, chimps and humans have more than 99% identical DNA. Um, depending on the species, or this, yeah, the species, uh, I think gibbons are the ones, I want to say it's gibbons, we have 99.9% .9 identical DNA, and so there's just that tricky 0.1%. Um, so we're very similar. So that just means that our common ancestor was probably not too long ago. Uh, we've also done this with gorillas and baboons, and they have 95% identical DNA to humans, and so that means we have a common ancestor, but it was a little farther back down the tree of life than the chips. In mice, we have 80% identical DNA, so once again, we remove that common ancestor and it's way um, down the tree, much farther away than, say, us and chimps. And we do the same thing. So when we're, uh, we're doing it for DNA, and then we look at enzymes and things like that. And so we talk about amino acids, which build proteins, and that helps build the physical representation of what DNA looks like. You have blue eyes or brown hair or whatever, because of the representation those proteins have built for you. Um, the genes give them the instructions and the proteins go build that. And so we look at amino acids which make proteins. And so we differ from monkeys by one amino acid, which is so close it, to identical, it's amazing. So that means our common ancestor was very recent. Molecular comparisons, same thing I just said. This is just showing you in pictures. Mutations are a source of variation. Um, if you look at the picture on the left of the squirrels, the white one has what's called albinism, which, you know, is like albino. And so that's a mutation where you don't have any color. And a lot of people think, well, but he has color. His eyes are red. No, um, an albinism in animals, often that lack of melanin, that lack of color, 
comes out in eyeballs represented as red. In humans, it comes out as like a clear or a very light blue, kind of an icy. Um, and so that's, that's just albinism. Now, the bear down here, the polar bear, he does not have albinism. He, he has a mutation for webbed feet so that he can swim better. Um, and the outer coatings of his fur are actually hollow and translucent, so they reflect the snow around him. Um, not all of his fur is translucent, but just the outer layer. Genetic recombination, sexual reproduction leads to new combinations of genes, and that's awesome, okay? Um, because if you're all the same, then one virus could take you all out. But because we're all different, we have a much higher uh, likelihood to survive as a species. Uh, we've already talked about speciation too a little bit. Let me go to this picture first. Okay, this is the best way to analyze it. Um, if a species gets geographically isolated for whatever reason, like a giant river um, forms down the middle, uh, it can lead to reproductive isolation. And so what that means is if this population of squirrels gets stuck over here and this population of squirrels gets stuck over here and there's a giant river between us and um, there's no way for these squirrels to get across the river over time that can lead to reproductive isolation where these squirrels change so much that they can no longer reproduce with the ones on this side of the river so they each become their own new species it's pretty cool but it takes a long time Here's an example of geographic isolation for the northern spotted owl. It's up here on the coast, the west coast of the United States. And then the Mexican spotted owl, of course, is down here. Um, in between them is the massive desert. And so there's not enough water or resources to fly over that desert and survive. And so they became isolated. So they can no longer breed together. This is the same thing, reproductive isolation. It's just saying that when we have mules, it's a mix between a donkey and a horse. Mules are not actually their own species because um, they cannot reproduce. Two mules don't make a baby mule. You can only get mules from a horse and a donkey. And so that is reproductive isolation because they do not produce a viable offspring. Uh, that cannot be a species. Um, I don't want to cover this right now because we're not there yet. Okay, so there's two evolutionary time frames. There's gradualism and punctuated equilibri ugh, equilibrium. Gradualism is what you've learned your whole life. Slow and easy change. Gradually, here we go. Punctuated equilibrium is usually when a natural disaster has happened or something uh, has very rapidly impacted a large region. And then it's like, boom, and suddenly there's a massive change in evolution. Uh, but there is no small gradual. It's like, here's this. Bam, here's a new species. Um, it's pretty crazy. So that one doesn't happen super often. Everything you need to study about it is going to be under gradualism for 10th grade, but it's just good to know what punctuated equilibrium is. Here are pictures of gradualism. You can see where it slowly changed in this environment to favor this shape, and it slowly changed in this environment to favor that shape. Here's punctuated equilibrium. Hey, we have a T-Rex and a Brontosaurus. Bam! A natural disaster, right? Like Ice Age 1. Woo! We have raptors. Bam! Ice Age 2. We now have parrots. Okay? Um, it's like crocodiles and birds came from uh, reptile ancestors. There were birds flying around with reptiles, but it's thought because of all of these natural disaster events, that birds were small enough to fly away and survive and say a t-rex was not so that's punctuated equilibrium ice age meteor impact massive worldly volcano things like that would have caused punctuated equilibrium um same picture really okay convergent evolution let's save this for another lecture and let you get through these first two videos and then email me if you have any questions just do the page in your packet on evidence for evolution and get through that and um, email me and we'll check in and we'll get it done and then we'll start something new, okay?